私は救ってあげたいあなたの魂そして刹那ちゃんの魂を This is definitely not Madoka Kanai, but these are definitely swords. This is definitely one very sad, mad bitch. Her name is Altair, and she's the main villain of Recreators. I want you to remember that because it's important. This whole scene is also kind of important, and I hope I don't get copyright striked for playing it here because that means I'll have to re edit the opening of this video. This is part two of my two part essay video about Recreators, an anime about ideas. Please watch part one, unless you're a masochist. <laughs> It's fine, darling. I don't kink shame. In the first part of my two part essay, I neglected to mention who the main character of Recreators is, or even to explain the central conflict of the narrative. This was a deliberate choice on my part. You see, the actual show obfuscates the answer to the question of the identity of its protagonist for quite a while. At the beginning of the series, the narrator, Mizushi no Sota, says plainly that he is not the protagonist. That is to say, if you consider the protagonist to be, quote, the person at the center of events, which is definitely not Sota. He, as he himself clarifies, is only the narrator. So we have Sota, the audience, avatar, every person, and narrator. And we also have Medeora, who effectively serves as the voice of the author and the show's ideology overall. And we have Altair, the villain who plans to destroy the world by shattering its rationale. If you'll remember the concept of acceptance that was brought up in the previous video, the reason this effort to amend salacious power sets did not work is because the viewing public did not witness and accept the changes. Well, there's that, and there's also the physical laws of the real world. The magic and sci-fi powers and gadgets, and even the very presence of the creations, violates those laws, and the world bends its laws ever so slightly to accommodate these irregularities. Mayday Meteora terms this phenomenon restoration power. The more people might see and know about the fictional creations having come to the real world and fully accept them as real and not just existing in the alternate world of a story, then the more the world's rationality weakens, the more the restoration power deteriorates, and then existence just implodes on itself. <sighs> That's a lot of a mouthful. Whatever. Acceptance is the important thing here. People accept that changes or additions to a story or character are true, and that becomes true. Makes sense enough. Okay, so let's talk about Altair. This is your last spoiler warning, I guess. <sighs> Prior to the start of the series, Sota meets a bright young artist, a girl named Yuna, Shimazaki Yuna, known on this website that is definitely not Pixiv by her pen name, Setsuna. In a remarkably true-to-life depiction of what meeting an internet friend is like, the two of them meet up for a convention and become close. Shortly thereafter, Setsuna becomes more popular on the not Pixiv, and Sota, languishing in relative obscurity, feels distant from her. Then, in a remarkably true-to-life depiction of what internet bullshit is like, some bad actors fabricate false allegations of plagiarism against Setsuna and incite a harassment campaign against her. Sota thinks to defend her, but hesitates, and ultimately ghosts that discourse. 
島崎さんが足を引っ張られることで自分が置いていかれる寂しさが少しだけ消えてゆくような僕の中のどこかにはそんな嫌な満足感があったんです Some time later, Sota receives a message from Setsuna, voicing her distress at the situation and asking a question. Sota san, Watashi, kaite mo ii no de shou ka? Kakitaku natte mo ii no de shou ka? Sota's response Don't ask me. Setsuna leaves behind a new drawing at long last, the image of a girl. And a music video featuring her, accompanied by an original song, and one last lone, deeply haunting DM to Sota. And thus, in a remarkably true to life depiction, Setsuna is cancelled. Mosimosi. Ano, Mizushina Sota san no denwa de shoka. Hai, so des kedo. Totsen no gorendak, Moshiwake gozaimase. Watakshi, Shimazaki yuna no ha de gozaimase. And those were the circumstances under which Altair was born. Not a story, not a publisher, just one. Very sad girl's final moments of despair gave rise to one very sad, mad bitch. <laughs> Context is in order. All of the history revolving around Yuna, aka Setsuna, that I just revealed is not doled out to the audience until episodes 11 and 12. This scene here is from the final moments of episode 8. Earlier in that episode, in earlier episodes, Mamika shied away from violent confrontation, being the pacifist magical girl she is, from a nice show, where everything is nice, but moves from that position in accordance with the realization that using force is the only feasible way to stop everyone from fighting. Now, she faces Altair confidently, poised to fight with her life should she need to, and fight with her life she does, in an explosive confrontation that ultimately takes her life. But before that, Mamika says something else. これは復讐なんだよね。to which Altair's response is as simple and pointed as her swords. So, Altair's creator, Setsuna, is dead. In remaining consistent with the show's framing of creator and creation as parent and child, this means Altair's mother is dead. Therefore, Altair is an orphan. But wait a second. Meteora is also an orphan. Her creator has died as well. What, then, is different between them? 
Though Meteora had considered simply standing by and watching the world end as Altair tore it all down, she chose not to because she came to appreciate the beauty of the world and to understand that she and her story was loved by her creator. Those two things, as I established in the previous video, are the core tenets of the arcs that every one of the creations go through after coming to the real world. They come, and the world changes them, all of them, as they learn the truth of their existence and come to terms with that truth. That the world is beautiful, and that their creators are hardly as godlike as they would like to believe. And Mamika wants to help Altair understand this after having heard Altair's story from Sota. However, Altair is not capable of understanding this truth, because she was not ridden with the possibility to do so. She was given a simple story of pure emotion, one which laid bare Setsuna's feelings of resentment and rage, and left the world to write the rest. While the other creations were written as complex people with detailed worldviews and personalities that organically acclimated to their new context, Altair is not like them. She is a literal one-note personality, a creature of blind emotion, who cries for her god below a silent moon. Or rather, a god. Setsuna, or to be specific, her particular idea of Setsuna, the only Setsuna she can now know. Perhaps that was the Setsuna who created her, but not the Setsuna who once was, and certainly not the Setsuna that Sota knew. So, what else sets Meteora and Altair apart? Well, to put it simply, copyright. Also canon. Although the individual responsible for originally conceiving of Meteora no longer exists, there is still a video game company which owns the intellectual property of the Falcon, and by extension, Meteora, and therefore a consistent but limited canon surrounding Meteora which must be maintained. The broader fandom believes in Meteora and the other creations only according to the canon created by the author. Failing that, the canon created by the company that holds the intellectual property of the world, and failing that, the fanon or fan canon created by the fandom. The fandom constructs wikis, fan art, fan fiction, etc., and collectively chooses, through consensus, what is true and what is not. So called official additions to the canon may be rejected, while some popular fan fiction or widely adopted headcanon may be accepted. And through this, the fans may spin new characters, new stories, new ideas, entirely new worlds, even, out of the these consensual rejections and acceptances. Sometimes, a derivative idea so far removed from the original that it cannot be reconciled with the established canon may be introduced, and rather than reject it, audiences might accept it as an entirely new idea. Ergo, Altair. <laughs> To put this another way, Altair's story is purposefully unfinished. As Setsuna says in her final message, she hopes Altair will be loved. The intent was to leave Altair in the hands of a fandom that would love her, that would add to her. And that is why Altair has the power of the Holopsicon, an ability which allows her to wield yet more powers for every work that is added to her canon. Without a story, without a linear canon, without being under the purview of copyright, Altair is unlimited, unchained, free to make her own decisions, to choose where her story might go from here, to have the chance to be loved, as Setsuna was not. The other creations have other plots to follow, worlds to stay within, stories to see the ends of. All things enforced by the narrow canon of the copyrights which they are restrained by. But Altair is just an idea, free for all to create with, to build new worlds for her. This is the greatest blessing Setsuna could possibly have given her. Freedom. The freedom to be an idea. The most pure 
raw idea, unbound by any and all constraints of logic and law, to be created from the commons, from the collective, from a fandom that loves you so that they gave you an infinite amount of powers. It is a blessing that Altair, tragically, lacks the capacity to appreciate, but it is, nonetheless, wonderful. Because, as deadly as Altair is, as damaged as her soul may be, she is, nonetheless, beautiful. Not because of a company, or an auteur, but because of a community that loved her enough to give that to her. Nothing could be more beautiful than that. To stop Altair from destroying the world, the creators and creations conclude that, as Setsuna is dead and there is no other sole intellectual property owner whose cooperation they can solicit, the only alternative left to them is to convince the viewing public to accept the idea that Altair has been canonically defeated. In order to do so, they will need to stage a story, which they name the Elimination Chamber Festival, in which they are the heroes and Altair is the villain, have the audience accept this scenario and win. To prepare, they set about seeding MacGuffins, foreshadowing new characters and new powers within their stories. So basically, they do Avengers Endgame, but in real life. To accomplish this, a laborious and time-consuming process of negotiation is required. In particular, negotiation with the logical constructs of canon and copyright that I mentioned earlier. The Japanese government, primarily represented by Special Countermeasures Council agent Kikuchihara, gathers the creators and briefs them, negotiates intellectual property rights and release schedules with the executives at the relevant companies, and creates the necessary front for the battle. Wouldn't it be fucking dope if the actual government gave as much of a shit about real-life problems caused by real-life things as the anime government gives about anime problems caused by fictional characters. The creators, meanwhile, are left to negotiate the matter of canon, reconciling the different worldviews and tones that their stories present, seeding the MacGuffins, the new characters, the power level increases, the spin-offs, everyone getting locked and loaded, or getting buff, or whatever, before the final battle. Except it takes six months, and it involves a bunch of creatives sitting around in a room writing and, and drawing and going on a hot springs break. And the recap episode before this entails an extended monologue about the well-being of the animation staff. The real-life animation staff, I mean. そもそも本作は多くの登場人物が入り乱れ、画面密度が濃い上、クライアントの要求度もそれなりに高い。これくらいのインターバルがないと、監督や現場P が後半を待たずにカスカスのミイラになってしまう。did I mention that I love this show? Sota, meanwhile, is left to negotiate with his emotions, and specifically his guilt over the fallout between himself and Setsuna that led to her ultimate death. Medeora firmly and emphatically advises him to try to heal, to try to help as much as he can, to take responsibility for his failure to address Setsuna's crisis. He takes that call to heart, and soon after comes up with an idea, setting up the resolution of the narrative, which we haven't got into yet. Now, in order to pat out this video essay, I want to take a short detour to talk about Chico Jean Magane. This is Chico Jean Magane, who is just about my favorite character in the series. She's the villain in her story, a high school murder mystery light novel, and a real bitchy bitch who gives absolutely zero fucks and likes to play word games. For a pretty good reason, it turns out. Magane's power is the infant deception of words, which allows her to reverse the principles of cause and effect to turn lies into reality under the condition that someone to whom she she is speaking must explicitly deny her lie, which she achieves by provoking her target into insisting that she's wrong. She uses this power to murder people, and just generally do whatever the hell she likes, in the pursuit of entertainment and pleasure. Although I disagree with the murder part, her sense of absolute joy and abandon in the midst of a chaotic world is absolutely an energy I respect. 
fact. In the story from which Megane comes, she faces a constant uphill battle in her aim to cause havoc. Much like the villain character Yoshe Kage Kira does in JoJo's Bizarre Adventure, her activities are constantly hindered by the investigative efforts of the detectives who seek to bring her to justice for her crimes, and she puts a great deal of effort into eluding her pursuers. However, whereas Kira's propensity for violence exists because he specifically enjoys murdering women and taking possession of their mutilated body parts, Magane straight up just wants to have fun. She doesn't care if that involves murder, murder by inaction, manipulating people into trying to murder each other, or dressing up as a maid. She just likes fun, and the way she's grown accustomed to having that fun from her experiences in her native story world often comes at the expense of others. Murder is actually really, really easy for a clever, duplicitous, and resourceful person to get away with in the real world, where there are no intrepid detective heroes to hunt such people. So before long, Magane does the obvious thing for an undeterred, intelligent villain to do in the real world. She becomes a capitalist. However, seeing as she faces a path of least resistance there, since this is a normal around here, Magane apparently finds this to be not particularly fulfilling. She may have been annoyed by the heroes of her story pursuing her, but at least there was some thrills to be had there. This? Meh. So, when she's implored by Alice to actually make herself useful and help out with the endgame, she perks up. That sounds fun doesn't it? Magane interrogates Soda about his motivations, and questions the value of the idea he has for the story. It hasn't been properly foreshadowed in the established canon setting up the Elimination Chamber Festival, and therefore there is not enough acceptance to make it manifest. It's, as Magane says, not real. A story only becomes a truth once it's accepted into the agreed-upon consensus reality shared by the audience. Magane is quick to point out that if he created this idea of for himself, then, well, it's still valid, right? Making art for your own sake, after all, is as valid a reason to make art as any. Lots of artists have made art for themselves before. It doesn't make their art any less genuine just because they never shared it. But that's not good enough. As Soda responds, Magane does the obvious thing, the fun thing. She helps him open the door. With the help of her infinite deception of words, Sota is able to circumvent the rule of acceptance and make his idea manifest. And that idea... All the plot devices, all of the extra powers, all of the connecting tissue between the stories that the creators built, all of it comes crashing down. The negotiations between canon and copyright are no match for Altair's infinite power of the Holopsicon. Because the protagonist of this story, as it turns out, the person at the center of events is Altair. The audience, Altair's loving fanbase, has chosen, accepted Altair as their hero, and she is all too happy to oblige. The creators can try to set traps for Altair. They can boost the power levels of the creations all they want. But as Altair plainly says, clever logic is a slave to emotion. What the creators had all forgotten in their preoccupation with crafting the perfect story, with all the right pieces coming into play, is that it's not the careful weaving of a logically consistent plot that makes a strong story. But Sota's idea... Sota's idea is different. It is precisely because it is predicated upon emotion, and lacks any accepted logical narrative backing it up, that it works as it does. <laughs> Thank you. 
People die when they are killed. That much is obvious, and only natural. People die, and the dead cannot be brought back. But ideas do not die. Ideas live forever in the hearts and minds of those with the courage to remember them. Altair only remembers the idea of a spiteful Setsuna, the embodiment of the sorrow and resentment she was cursed with in her creator's dying moments. That was the only Setsuna she knew, the only Setsuna she could comprehend. That is her entire character, only able to feel one feeling, to act in the service of one emotion, no matter how irrational. But Sota only remembers a kind, warm, Setsuna. A Setsuna with light and hope left in her. A passionate Setsuna, who was excited to be alive, to create, to be a part of the world. Setsuna may have turned spiteful, sorrowful, vengeful, desperate, but Sota doesn't know that Setsuna. He chooses to remember her as the person he believes she was, the person he has faith in to save Altair. And he shows Altair that Setsuna, not the sad Setsuna she wept for under that silent moon. Altair, finally, is able to understand the beauty of the freedom she was blessed with, and it is this recognition gifted to her by Sota, by this Setsuna, that finally causes her to change, as all the other creations have done. Setsuna, the estranged artist, finally meets her child. Altair, the orphaned creation, finally finds her mother, and her soul is saved.
creators appears to hesitate on the matter of if the Setsuna we see with whom Altair reunited was the real Setsuna. Meteora ponders this point momentarily when she visits Setsuna's grave with Sota, before shaking her head and turning away. That is a question Meteora, as the voice of the show, does not feel comfortable answering. And so it hangs in the air, a mystery left to the viewing party to decide. And decide, the viewing party shall. And by the viewing party, I mean me. People are ideas, as much are characters, or stories, or any other piece of art. If you'll recall, Mereora speaks earlier in the show of how she will be reborn forever, as long as people continue to play the game in which she appears. This Mereora is only one idea of Mereora, made manifest in the medium of a human, and for everyone who meets Mereora, be it this Mereora in the world of recreators, or the digital Mereora in the game within that world, another Mereora will be born again and again forever. Just just as a new inception is created in the minds of everyone who bears witness to it, a new Meteora is created, and a new Setsuna was imagined by everyone who met her, and will be imagined by everyone to whom Sota tells of her. And this is the same for you, and the same for me, and anyone else who continues to be remembered. A new Joyce will be imagined in the hearts and minds of every one of you who watches this video. Joyce, the human being, is under strict physical and social limitations. But I, Joyce the idea, as represented by this image and this recording, am here. This body I inhabit will one day die and turn to nothing and my own subjective idea of myself may die with me. But as long as my YouTube channel, or the videos I've posted on it, or anything else I've published online, or any memory thereof, should continue to exist, I will remain alive forever as an idea. I, Joyce, the idea spread throughout all of your hearts, will be here forever. as long as you should keep me alive.